Hello and welcome to this video on heats of reaction and standard states. At the end of this video you will be able to define a standard state, calculate the standard heat of reaction from heats of formation, define Hess's law and calculate the heat of reaction at different temperatures using heat of formation and heat capacity data. Now we know that reactions can either generate or absorb heat, so either exothermic or endothermic. The measure of this is the heat of reaction. And so here's a, a common uh, reaction that we see, so the combustion of, of methane, so a negative heat of reaction, strongly exothermic. So one thing to note here is that for the heat of reaction, we need to define it as kilojoules or joules per mole of something. Okay, so here I've just used per mole of uh, CH4 reactant. Uh, if I said per mole of H2O produced, um, I'd have to divide everything by two. Now, we could calculate the heat of reaction by this equation down the bottom. But the issue with this is, is that we don't actually know what the absolute enthalpy is for each of these components. So we need to find a different way of calculating the heat of reaction. And the important thing in doing this is something called the heats of formation. So the heat of formation of a compound uh, like water is the heat of reaction when elements at their standard state, and we'll define standard state in a minute, react to form one mole of the compound at its standard state at a specific temperature. So heats of formation and heats of reactions change with temperature. So whenever you say this is the heat of reaction or this is the heat of formation, you have to be saying this is what that is at a particular temperature. So for example, uh, to form water, if we take H2 and uh, oxygen in their standard states and react them to form uh, water in its liquid state, the heat of this reaction is equal to the heat of formation for H2O. Now uh, you've seen this little circle next to the enthalpy popping up. So, so this superscript means that things are at standard conditions. So every element of that reaction, each compound in that reaction is at standard conditions. So what is a, a standard state? The standard state of a substance is defined by its composition and its concentration. And so the reason that we define standard states is that it allows us to, to tabulate data at a condition that we know. And it's normally tabulated at a particular temperature. So you remember that I said that heats of formation and heats of reaction will change with temperature. So, but we can only tabulate things uh, at a particular temperature. We can't tabulate uh, heats of formation at any temperature. So the normal thing to do is to tabulate uh, heats of formation data at 298 Kelvin. But that temperature is not defining the standard state. It's a reference temperature only. And so in terms of standard states, we can roughly break things down into two classes. When we're looking at a pure substance, okay, so pure hydrogen, pure oxygen, pure water, then when we're talking about a gas, the standard state is at a particular pressure and it's also a pure ideal gas gas. For a liquid and a solid, again, it's at one atmosphere of pressure. Uh, the, uh, the liquid or the solid is pure, there are no impurities, and that defines the standard state. For solutions, which we'll talk about in more detail later on the, in the semester, the same principle applies. So except that we have a bit more freedom, we can actually define its concentration within something. So, so two common standard states for a solution are to define a one molal aqueous solution or a one weight percent solid solution, but we'll go into more depth later on. So what standard state do I choose? Well, 
basically you're just choosing the one that is in the the data source that you're going to use so so very commonly for this like i said before is that the heats of formation data will be tabulated at 298 kelvin and unless it says otherwise the standard state pressure will be one bar or one atmosphere now an important thing to to note in this table that we see with uh with silver here is that the uh is that the standard the standard heat of formation of an element is zero okay so if an element is in its most stable form so silver at uh, 298 Kelvin is a solid, of course, then the heat of formation will be zero. Now, it is possible for us to define a heat of formation of a non-stable phase. So, so here in this table, again, we've got the heat of formation of silver as a liquid at 298 Kelvin. Even though that can't actually exist in real life, we can still actually calculate what it would take to actually form a liquid at that temperature. Now, an important concept in being able to use heat of formation is Hess's law. And Hess's law is that the overall heat of reaction can be uh, calculated as the sum of other reactions that add up to give you your overall reaction. So going back to our methane combustion example, we can take the three equations here, so which are heats of formation equation, so the top one's the heat of formation to form methane, then the heat of formation to form carbon dioxide, and then the heat of formation to form water. And so uh, when each of these reactions is added together, then I can get the heat of the overall reaction. Now converting those reaction heats of each of those sub-reactions into the heats of formation then we can use the heats of formation data to calculate this overall heat of reaction. One important thing to note here is the stoichiometry, stoichiometric coefficients. Okay, so, so for the top reaction, we had to add in a negative to match the reaction to heat of formation. And for the bottom reaction, we've had to add in the stoichiometric coefficient of two to match the reaction uh, to the heat of formation. Now, when we add these things together to give us the overall heat of reaction, we can see that we can calculate it just based on heats of formation data. Now, knowing that the heat of formation of oxygen as a gas at 298 Kelvin is zero, we can uh, actually add that to the equation as well. Now, when we do that, we get a very general equation. So, so this equation then generalizes to the sum of the stoichiometric coefficient times by the heat of formation of each of the components. So, so the reaction that we've written there to calculate the heat of reaction for combusting methane is just the sum of each of the heats of formation multiplied by the stoichiometric coefficient. This equation is very, very important. We'll be using this again and again and again throughout the course. So, so this is what we've done so far is all fine in terms of calculating heats of reaction at 298 Kelvin. But of course, not all reactions happen at 298 Kelvin. In fact, uh, very few of them do. So what we need is a path and a technique to be able to calculate the heat of reaction at different temperatures. So we go back to our people standing in this bizarre field here. We need to select a path to be able to get between one person and another and be able to use that path to calculate the difference between them. And so, so what we we're doing on this slide is setting up such a path. So what I'm interested in is uh, what's the heat of reaction for carbon monoxide uh, plus oxygen going on to form carbon dioxide? Okay, so I'm interested in this, in what the heat of reaction is at 1000 degrees Kelvin. 
So to, to get from point A to point B across the black line, I can't actually do that because I don't have tabulated data at 1,000 degrees Kelvin. So instead of doing that, I'm going to use a path to give me that heat of reaction. So my first step is to cool my reactants down to 298 Kelvin. And the reason that I take that step is because then at 298 Kelvin, I can calculate the second delta H, which is just the heat of reaction at 298 Kelvin. So we just covered that in the previous slide. And then once I form my CO2, then the final step is to heat the CO2 back up to 1000 degrees Kelvin. So this path in red is equivalent to taking the reaction step in black. And so to do this, you're using the component skills that we've covered previously. So the first step is a delta H change without any phase change. So we're just integrating from 1000 degrees Kelvin to 298. So that's important from 1000 to 298. Uh, it's easy to, to write it the other way around out of habit. Our heat of reaction, which we just covered a couple of slides ago, is just the sum of the stoichiometric coefficient times by the heat of formation. So this is just tabulated data. We can, we can take that off the table. And then the final step is heating from 298 up to 1000 degrees Kelvin for CO2. Again, no phase change. So this is just an integration of the heat capacity. And we'll remember from uh, a previous video that the heat capacity of CO2 uh, changes a lot with temperature, particularly once you start getting up to that 1000 degree range. So if we add these three steps together, then what we get is a general equation for the heat of reaction at 1000 degrees Kelvin. In the next step, I can sort of simplify things a little bit further by making all my integrals from 298 to 1000 degrees Kelvin. And so, of course, when you flip your integration around, that means that you uh, stick a negative out the front to, to keep the product the same. So the reason that we're doing that then is that this allows us to write a very general equation that if we're interested in the heat of reaction at temperature two, then we can calculate that if we know the heat of reaction at temperature one, okay, and we generally do it 298 Kelvin, and then we can add up all these heating terms from the temperature that we have as a reference, normally 298, up to the temperature that we're interested in. And so all these uh, coefficients here, A, B, C, uh, D and E are, are stoichiometric coefficients. So we can collapse this equation down to a very general form here. Now this equation is for no phase change only. With a phase change, the more general way to write the equation is this final equation here, where uh, instead of just saying the integral of the heat capacity, we're just saying the change in enthalpy and going from T1 to T2, okay, which uh, may or may not include a phase change. Okay, so to recap what we've covered in this lesson, reactions can be an exothermic or endothermic. To calculate that heat of reaction at a standard state, this can be done using heats of formation data at standard state. Heats of formation data at standard state is tabulated at the standard state, okay, so a particular pressure, normally one atmosphere, and at a reference temperature. It's a reference temperature. The temperature is not part of the standard state. A standard state is of a particular purity and pressure. The heat of reaction can be calculated at, that should say, it can be calculated at different temperatures, as we saw in the previous couple of slides. Thank you for your time and attention.